Africa Prime, brought to you by Jamison Select Reserve. At the end of 2008, the world was plunged into economic turmoil. The global downturn wreaked havoc on financial markets, including those in Africa. However, markets have since started to stabilize, and according to the recent African Economic Outlook report, African economies have rebounded from the slump as well. In fact, seven of the ten fastest growing economies in the world are from Africa. Hello and welcome to Africa Prime. I'm Godfrey Mutizwa. This week, the second of this edition of Africa Prime, we take a closer look at the post-2008 economic world order in Africa. And joining me in studio to give us their views are Simon Fremantle, he is Senior Analyst, Africa Political Economy Unit at Standard Bank Group, and uh, Martin Davies, he is CEO, Frontier Advisory, and E. Daniel Kinnear, Senior Executive Associate, Africa Strategy Group. Gentlemen, welcome. When history is written, when people talk about the 2008 economic crisis, many people make reference to the crash on Wall Street and London, but little forgotten is that there was a crash of a different sort, the crash in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwean inflation reached 89.7 sextillion percent, according to uh, Steve Hank, and he is a professor of applied economics at John Hopkins University. I begin with Zimbabwe because it illustrates the severity of the 2008 crisis. Let's begin first by with you, E. Daniel, but I'll refer to you as Daniel as we go along. Daniel, let me begin with you. 2008, we had this massive crash, and we saw, as I said, Zimbabwe was one of the worst hit. Can you paint a picture for us, just in terms of the impact that this had on African economies as a whole? Yeah, I think, but l let's address the issue of Zimbabwe. I think the, the quantum that uh, you've just quoted uh, is less a result of the global economic crisis, True. Uh, which was a consequence of the financial crisis. True. Uh, it was more a consequence of uh, an amalgam of issues uh, and also the political risk and uh, credit rating st status of Zimbabwe <coughs> at sure. that stage. But I think uh, the continent overall uh, was on a, an upswing on growth uh, right to the eve of the financial crisis. Uh, and when it was realized that uh, no one knew a for had a formula to manage it and it did not originate in Africa, the, the conflagration uh, globally uh, was less evident in Africa. And uh, I think Africa, it, it, it ex it's because maybe because Africa was less exposed to the f international financial markets in the sense of loans and lending to multilateral institutions or African companies and governments who were investing in Africa. Right. So th there was no umbilical that, that would bring the shock into the Africa space. And that, in a way, was the sort of buffer that uh, permitted African countries uh, and African economies to, to take the shock, but it was not of the same impact that it was in Europe or in the United States. Yeah. Martin, from what you saw, from what you remember of the numbers, just how deep was the damage done by the 2008 crisis? Mm. Well, in the context of Africa, I think uh, often for many of these economies, and just two examples, Zimbabwe was certainly not a, a, a product or result of a Western financial crisis. It was a result of effectively Zani PF pressing the, the self-destruct button mm. over the course of the last 10 years. I think in other cases in across the continent, you find um, many of these, these economies, unfortunately, are in a perpetual state of crisis. Western financial crisis largely had no meaning, and as Daniel said, is maybe at a time of crisis like this, the contagion effect right. was, uh, was largely not there because of lack of plugged into to sort of Western largely capital markets. Yeah. To the same extent, is that um, you know at times of crisis, being less globalized is 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 a, is a benefit as opposed to more. So yeah. Africa, obviously, we contracted what two percent in two thousand nine as a result of what happened, you know, the visible onset of the crisis in September 2008. Right. I think of greatest concern, it's only starting to play out now even in, in terms of the continent, is when you have um, such significant exposure uh, to, uh, or reliance should I say, by many economies in sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. On on uh, on donor development aid, effectively, you know, upwards of fifty percent in many cases of countries, which are dependent for their budget on donor aid. Now we're seeing the crisis moving from financial crisis more towards sovereign debt crisis, particularly in Western Europe, right. 
ultimately this will be politically determined, of course. Yeah. But as this starts, as this crisis continues to move into, or continues, but it's really moving into sort of a different sort of phase now, of, is there exposure for the content, not through the financial services sector, as Daniel alluded to, but perhaps more so around the potential cutbacks in foreign aid to our continent, right. where many of these countries are so dependent. I think that's a key risk going forward. Yeah, so we're going to examine this crisis. If I can come to you, Simon, now, the message that I'm getting from the two gentlemen is that the impact was <coughs> not as direct as it was in the other developed economies, largely because, of course, we know uh, the, the, the structure of Africa's economy. But you guys at Standard Bank, you would have seen some of the numbers, some of the more immediate effects through currencies like the RAND through currencies like the Zambian, the Zambian Kwacha. In your estimation, how much damage was done? Well, I think some of the points have been mentioned, but you also need to consider that there's, Africa is not a homogenous block. So we've sure. got a lot of the economies are commodity exporting nations mm -hmm. and an equal amount of commodity importing nations. So during the crisis, I was living in Nairobi in Kenya, for example, and Kenya is a commodity importing nation, as is much of the East African environment. Compare <coughs> the manner in which East Africa was able to ride out the recession compared to, say, Angola or Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria has managed to diversify its economy, whereas Angola, 90-odd percent of its exports are crude oil. So the, the collapse of the, the price of oil had a hugely detrimental effect on, on Angolan GDP growth. It dropped almost 15% in the, in the space of a year. Mm -hmm. But the rebound has been equally strong. So some of the African economies, and Zambia was very much part of that equation as well, uh, that are heavily reliant on these commodity exports, <coughs> suffered more than the others that are, as, as Daniel was saying, not as exposed to global financial markets. So the, the, the contagion risk there was fairly low mm -hmm. um, and don't rely on, on commodity exports uh, in order to, to finance the, the government uh, purse. Yeah. So I think there was a divergence there. But certainly, you know, in terms of the more exposed markets, of which Kenya is one, mm. the ability to raise finance and the risk associated with that uh, did have an impact in terms of, of uh, you know, the bank's operations in these markets. Mm -hmm. But it was more muted than we saw in other uh, more exposed emerging markets, without a doubt. Yeah, um, including South Africa, I Including suppose. South Africa, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and fairly shallow capital markets as well, uh, to an extent, shielded these markets. Yeah. But, but there certainly was uh, an offshoot, and I think some of the markets, particularly the commodity exporting ones, suffered yeah. disproportionately high. Yeah, so where are we now? Paint a picture in terms of the recovery of the whole geography, ge whole geography that Africa. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a large question. I think, <laughs> as is. you mentioned, the African but economic outlook... But maybe you could outlook, break it down into regions, if so, if you're able to. Certainly. The African yeah, economic maybe. outlook that you referred to in the introduction is very bullish, very positive around the African growth prospects. The African Development Bank has come out with similar, uh, you know, positive sentiments. Yeah. And I think as a bank, we subscribe to those. We're, we're in 16, 17 markets in the continent. And some of the markets that, that we're engaging in are, are extremely high growth markets. Ghana, for example, yeah. will be the fastest growing economy economy in the world this year. Uh, you've got economies like Ethiopia and Uganda growing at almost double digit rates. Mm -hmm. So in certain areas, and I think East Africa is set to outperform, uh, there have been some structural macroeconomic reforms there which are having a tremendously positive effect on growth. Um, and certain <coughs> other economies in West Africa, I mentioned Ghana, mm -hmm. um, and then some others due to the political risk fundamentals, Libya and, and Ivory Coast particularly, uh, will have a disastrous year this year. Yeah. Uh, you know, growth will contract to the extent of almost 10% in some of these markets. Sure. What's the common thread, Martin, in all these countries that are leading the recovery that we're seeing now? From what I hear, from what Simon is saying, it does look like we're talking about uh, the commodity exporters again? Mm. I think there's perhaps three factors that are driving this growth. I think firstly, in stating the obvious, commodity prices. Sure. Now, uh, one assumes that commodity super cycle driven by China is driving the prices higher. And of course, for commodity or resource dependent economies, uh, that's good news. I think the second factor, um, which we can talk about in more detail perhaps, is that of, of Chinese finance coming into their countries, particularly on the infrastructure side. The economy, Simon mentioned, Ethiopia, for example, uh, again, not a resource-rich country at all, approaching or perhaps even above double-digit growth this year, largely as due to infrastructure spend. The provider of that, of that finance coming out of China, Ghana, similarly so, a $9.7 billion uh, largely infrastructure, as well as to an extent oil, uh, funding package from Beijing to Ghana. So chi alignment to China is increase increasingly differentiating the winning states from the faltering states. I think the third factor, particularly in the context of Ethiopia and Ghana, again, maybe more so Ghana, is, is, is a good public sector management, mm -hmm. uh, at least uh, 
um, a focus, a focus on growth, uh, a focus on sort of you know what 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 the economic priorities of the country are and relatively well managed. Yeah. Uh, I think those are the three for me the key the three key differentiators going forward. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, I just want to pick up on something Simon raised, and I think sure. I think that's fundamental uh, in in the conversations about Africa is the failure uh, among African economists, uh, political scientists, to to try and sort of analyze Africa and realize that it's not homogeneous. Sure. Uh, and I think most reports, IMF or African Development Bank, you know, try and look at the, the oil exporting, uh, the, the non-oil exporting middle income, <coughs> and then of course the, the, the smaller states are, mm -hmm. and some of those states which are on the brink <coughs> of a failure. Mm -hmm. um, and of the 44, 45 now with the Republic of the Southern Sudan, right. uh, there, there is such a, a difference, uh, literacy among other issues. But I think that the uh, going forward, um, a recent report suggested that as we encourage investment into Africa to help it not only uh, mitigate any possibilities of falling be below the threshold of 2.5, 2.9 uh, that we that several economists are talking about, right. is also to look at investments coming into Africa, um, which I think Martin has touched on, and yeah. that is. If we look at the, the the place of China or India or or anyone else uh, on the economic models, do we l get rid of incentives like tax breaks and tax incentives, which are critical to the state to fund other social services, and eliminate that from the equation of incentives for investors mm -hmm. that are coming out of China, or be mm -hmm. they the state-owned mm -hmm. enterprises or institutions, and, and going forward? Because I think uh, this is a fantastic opportunity, and Standard Bank sitting. You know, has a great footprint across Africa. Yeah. Uh, probably sees how different Angola is from the rest of Africa, uh, and how do we find a model uh, that allows us now, in attracting that investment, the fact that we, we were we were not that impacted by the the global financial crises yeah. uh, in going forward. And I think it's it's a great opportunity, <coughs> a very small window yeah. of opportunity, but there's there's a need to rethink how we engage with those who invest. And even FDI, it represents probably only 12 to 14 percent of total investments in Africa. A lot of it is by African enterprises and African <coughs> governments in sectors like, like infrastructure. Sure. So the essence, is the main message is that the dynamic is changing. Yes. Uh, and I think the dynamic is not by, by default. I think it's by the opportunity that Africa uh, <coughs> uh, gained from not being exposed and impacted of the global financial crisis, and this is a great opportunity now to say well, not only that, but what can we do differently going forward? Absolutely, and that's part of uh, what we're going to examine in the second half.